What is dinner? What is a meal? Which is better, a truffle or a peach? I thought I knew the answers to these questions. I was wrong. I'm Anthony Bourdain, and for over 25 years I've been a chef in New York City. At the end of the 20th century, it was good to be a chef. I understood, I thought, the roots, the fundamentals, the boundaries of my trade. I was comfortable with those parameters. I knew certain things to be true. Art was good, science was bad. Food in its most natural state, or coaxed in a submission by application of heat, was good. Food that was processed was bad. Good food came from hot, chaotic spaces where overheated craftsmen sweated and toiled and cursed their capricious clientele and their cruel masters. Food technologists were people who only bred giant, flavorless fruits and vegetables, primarily for long shelf life and consistent coloration. But could a scientist also be an artist? Could something soulful, beautiful, and delicious be produced under laboratory conditions? I didn't think so. And then came Ferran Adria. Things are different now. The recently published El Bouilly cookbook, weighing in at nearly 10 pounds, is perhaps the hottest, most sought after, revolutionary document in the annals of cookbooks. Nearer to the black monolith in 2001, a space odyssey than a cookbook, it's gaped at, debated, poured over by chefs around the world, an object both spectacularly impressive and intimidating. Carrot foams, aerosol spaghettis, pastelous raviolis created in secret laboratories with the help of biochemists and an industrial designer. And behind all this is a chef named Ferran Adria. Before I met Ferran Adria, I dismissed him publicly as the foam dude and privately hoped that he would take his weird science approach to cooking and fade away. But like a bad penny, he kept popping up. It's no exaggeration to call Ferran Adria the most controversial chef on the planet. His restaurant, El Bui, is hands down the most sought after reservation. Now, I've come to terms with the fact that I'm getting old. I've come to terms with the fact that the world has changed. But none of that was helping me to understand what was going on in a restaurant in a remote area of the Costa Brava, in a laboratory in Barcelona, or inside the mind of Ferran Adria. And I had to find out. A mutual friend brought me over to the lab to meet him, and the first words out of his mouth to me were something like, so tomorrow I'm going to destroy your entire concept of what ham is and what ham can be, and the next day we met here, this store, and he proceeded to do just that. Hamanissimo, a tiny ham shop in the center of Barcelona? Admittedly, I was intrigued. For our first meeting, Ferran doesn't take me to some high-end restaurant, certainly not his high-end restaurant, and he doesn't want to hang out and show me some newfangled process in his lab. So why here? Why ham? What was it about this place that so fascinated him? My curiosity was piqued. He introduced me to Signor Martin, owner of Hamanissimo, who quickly began to educate me on the intricacies of making Spanish jamón, or ham. Hamanissimo is a specialty shop dealing in Aberico de Bilotta. Not just any old ham, but ham made from pata negra, a black-footed Iberian pig, which is allowed to graze freely in the fall and early winter months on Bilotta, the sweet acorn. Some of these jamons take over 40 years to make, and at just a glance, they're worth the wait. You know, it's not a matter of which is better. It's all have unique features and strengths. 
Jamons from three distinct regions of Spain, Extremadura, Andalusia, and Salamanca. Each has its own unique characteristics, depending on the particular conditions in which the pigs were raised and the various conditions in which they were cured. This Salamanca jamón comes from pigs raised by Señor Martín's own family. Martín points out to me that his father fed these pigs all the acorns they could eat. Oh, you know that's good. The Salamanca hams take a longer time to cure because they have less salt and more fat. You can tell when they're ready, when they begin to sweat. Simplification, but scads of information there. Curing these hams takes skill and patience. Knowing when they're ready, that's centuries of trial and error at work. Another way to determine the correct degree of curing and flavor is the cala, a thin bone spike. The bittersweet smell of the steak determines a lot. By ramming this bone into the thigh where the salt drips down, you can tell. No, I can't tell. You can't tell. He can tell. <laughs> Everything you need to know about this ham is the, the bone properly formed. What was it fed? Was it stored properly? Is it ready? Is it good? Is there enough? I mean, everything. It's all there. Experience and tradition tell them when it's ready. It's a little bit of a secret. You know, this stuff you don't throw on a slicer. That would be heretical. Look at that fat. Aquellos jamones... Listening to Martine and watching that magnificent ham being sliced, I was beginning to understand why Ferran brought me here. Why Hamanissimo might be a good starting point. Making ham, after all, is a process. It's all about the transformation of one food into another. Obviously, there was something about this transformation that Ferran was drawn to. There was no better place to be when eating a good meal is to have somebody who knows what the hell they're talking about take you by the hand and take you on a ride. You just sort of close your eyes and go with it. Oh, yes. El jamón ibérico de bellota, o el jamón ibérico, se debe comer con los dedos. They just pointed out that ham should be eaten with the fingers. I was very happy to hear that. So this ham has been under his family's control from birth until this point, which is my idea of quality control. Oh, yes. Look at this fat. It's in milk. This, right. mm. Oh, man. It's just beautiful. El animal lo consigue a partir de los 60 días de estar en el campo andando libremente. We were discussing the fat. This is one of the few animals in the world that do this naturally. The fat just doesn't pile on on the outside, it ripples through the meat. So the marbling, the fat that streaks through the lean, is achieved only in an animal that spends 60 days running around free. When you're drying the leg, the air, the microorganisms in the air, what's in the particular soil, all of that is part of the eventual flavor. Beautiful. And the flavor, you can taste what it ate, where it came from, that wonderful confluence of natural forces, the wind, the cold, the altitude, the diet. Beautiful thing. It's this knowledge and attention to detail that reminds me of an observation Ferran made when we ate here together for the first time. He said, what's wrong with transforming food? The making of ham is a process, Iberico ham is better than fresh pork, no? Just as good sherry is better than the grapes it's made with. After all that top quality Spanish ham, having tasted fatty acorn fed cured pork in all its freshly sliced glory, I find it hard to disagree. I wish you could smell this. The, the smell in this room is incredible. Do you think if I stuffed one of these things down my pants, I could make it through customs? I want one. I just want to have it hanging in my kitchen or my living room and gaze upon it. I think I understood a few vital and important points about Ferran Adria at this first meeting. At least I understood one thing. This is a guy who likes food.
people say that when you're talking about cooking, you're talking about cuisine, that there's nothing new under the sun. And you can't reinvent the wheel. But you're basically reinventing the same thing over and over and over, maybe adding a spoke here and there. But when you mention Ferran Adria, and what he's doing at his restaurant Albuy, people tend to get confused. I'm headed to Ferran's workshop to try to make sense of it all. So, through these doors, in what was once a Gothic era palace, a bunch of talented chefs and cooks developing new menus or a portal to another dimension. The controversy about Ferran Adria tends to focus on his approach. To the outside world, it seems distant, analytical, scientific, removed. Even for me, an old school French trained bistro cook of middling abilities, I don't like the sound of a guy who experiments in a workshop, whose kitchen forswears flame. No, I don't like the sound of that at all. This is the Taillère, erroneously referred to as the laboratory by those barely in the know, but really a workshop. When you walk into the Taillère's main workstation, there are backlit clear glass jars, hidden induction burners, and stealthily placed equipment everywhere. There's a definite element of Dr. No's secret laboratory at play. It's here in El Taller, or the workshop, that Ferran, his brother Alberto, their partner, Oriol Castro, a chemist, Per Castel, and an industrial designer, Luki Hubert, work together to push old concepts from last season forward and create and develop entirely new concepts. There is one concept at the heart of everything that is unchanging and truly revolutionary. While the world writes and speaks of Ferran Adria, Within the Taillère, there is an environment of teamwork. Results are what matters. Ideas are freely discussed and credit shared. And early in this visit, through our interpreter, Lucy Garcia, Ferran made sure I understood this. One of the very important things is the team. Normally, the chef is the center of the universe in the kitchen. I might be the media star, but they are part of the history of the Wii. They participate in the creativity in the same level as Fernandez. If you spent two days with Alberto or with Oriol, you would realize that in normal circumstances they should have their own restaurants. This is the, the big and great difference between the Bouilly and other creative restaurants. They never say, I, I did, I made. It's we. It's we. It's a team. Let's be clear here. Ferran is the guiding light and undisputed spiritual leader of this revolution. But the free exchange of ideas is based on this respect for the team. What is the, the question of the day? What are they investigating? He's looking at the sensation of grilling a peach. Um, and what's he crushing on? He's crushing smints, peach flavored smints. The ground up candy is sprinkled on the peach and used as a caramelizing agent. The treatment he's tried to give it is like a foie gras. It's it's seared on the outside, seared. soft in the middle. It looks like sauteed foie. Mm. It does feel like it, doesn't it? It's a bit too cooked. Now, making peaches eat like foie gras is a cute trick, but the team, I learned, is also examining a deeper set of issues. For them, the kitchen was like for a lot of cooks. Foie gras. Foie gras. Lobster. Lobster. Truffles. And one day. No, for you. Why? We asked ourselves, why? Mm -hmm. yeah. The price. And we decided Una pera. that a pear is, is the same as yeah. any of the best fish. No mejor ni peor. Not better or worse. Igual. It's the same. And this, it seems, is the crux of Ferran Adria's philosophy. Here he is working on transforming and assigning value to foods that we would normally underrate as less important than others. In developing new dishes and concepts, one must be organized. And here, every element, every technique is painstakingly recorded. 
In order to transform a food, one needs to know why food behaves the way it does and quantify that. To do that, they've developed a system of symbols and classifications for products and procedures. This information is used to create and continuously evolve a blueprint of culinary products, technologies, preparations, and styles. They refer to as simply the map. We were the first people to see this. They started this collaboration to ask the whys of things. They want to know about the science. Right. So any item that comes in, you examine it from all of these aspects. I see uh, mechanics, acoustics. Acoustics. Uh, no, I formula. So you just want people to think that they sit here and create chemical formula. This is not science class. No. This is yeah. cooking. Fantastic. <laughs> As Ferran said to me, if I make you a Spanish omelet, I'm doing something I already know how to do. Here, we try to do things we don't know how to do. Whoever created the first omelet created a technique and a concept. The tire exists to create new techniques and new concepts, sometimes small, sometimes big, but always new. Cucumber is eaten with lemon or vinegar. What happens when you exaggerate the proportions? I've been exaggerating proportions for years, but these guys are working on a different plane. I'm just trying to catch up here. It could be a cucumber that has no flavor or taste. Or it's lima con textura. Or it's a lime with texture. If I told you this was a citrus fruit from Tasmania, you would uh, say that. Uh huh. Yeah, I might buy that. Yeah. water and lactic acid. It's meringue-like in texture. You have a little sensation of fat. So next, you, you go to think about what flavors you could put in without yeah. destroying the texture. Truffle oil, you think, yes, yeah. that'll work. So Perfect. the pH, the acidity, is going to be very important on this. Yeah. The team is concerned with all aspects of the eating experience. Textures, colors, and tastes. Not just how something tastes, but how taste is experienced differently by each individual. We all think our taste is, the, is perfect, it's the best. It's ours. Parents brought something. There are people who genetically detect this and people who genetically cannot detect this. It's a bitter taste. No, no, no. No, 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 He, for example, doesn't know. This incredible. No. Si, 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 si. It's very bitter. Imagine what this means. We all taste in a different way. So two people out of ten at a table might find something bitter. Right. A lot of the work done in the lab is about perception, how things may not be what they appear. He's going to cook it, but he's going to try and make you get the impression that it's wrong. Ah. Look at the color. It's really beautiful. Yo necesito comer para. He has to eat it. Mm. You like it? Mm. Flavor roast. Right. But cuando lo ves, dices poco hecho. It looks undercooked, but it's cooked. No, no, it's perfect. to see something that has never been shown on television and in fact there's been some controversy within the ranks here over whether they want to show us at all they're not going to explain what they're doing but they are going to do it whatever it is Ferran and his team have developed a technique where they can make certain flavored liquids congeal at precisely the perfect temperature forming a thin shell around a viscous center today's experiment is an attempt at making mango caviar Some experiments end in failure. Still too thick. <laughs> Sometimes most experiments end in failure and need to be readdressed. Can be very much improved. They're going to try it more. But that's exactly why the taillere is so important. Last year, Luki joined them, an industrial designer. 
Given that you can't just pop down to your local Kmart and pick up aerosol spaghetti dispensers or glassware for serving carrot foams, Luki Hubert, the industrial designer, is a pretty busy guy. Not every item's purpose is self-evident, however. The rubber glove. I have to know. <laughs> This is for the end of the meal. Okay, so you're bien. Bye. We're a little bit wild. All the work gives an image of being quite cold and distant. We only do this to serve people and make them happy. El Taller is a place where questions are asked about the physical properties of food. Can we do this? Can we do that? Questions about dining about the fundamental nature of cuisine and gastronomy. In here, they work together as a team, experimenting, testing, and dreaming, trying and failing, and trying again to make things once again new. Two hours north of Barcelona, Spain, along the Costa Brava, Nestled in a small cove surrounded by trees is El Bui, Ferran Adria's tradition-defying, trend-setting restaurant. Do I look nervous? I'm nervous. I've seen the book. I've heard the theories. I've been to the lab. Now to eat the food. I'm nervous. Do I look nervous? I'm scared. I feel inadequate to the task. This has uh, been a kind of a life-changing uh, experience so far, and I, hell, I haven't even eaten the food yet. Do I have kind of a frightened, ner nervous, neurotic look on my face? My dog used to get this look when I yelled at him. I need a drink. The first thing one notices when entering El Bui is that it is indeed a restaurant, not a palace, a spaceship, a temple, or the culinary equivalent of Euro Disney. The dining area is reminiscent of the kind of upscale restaurants found around the world these days. The kitchen, however, is quite a different story. Taillere is defined by the freewheeling exchange of ideas in a collegial environment. This is a disciplined army of food professionals, putting on the equivalent of a Broadway show in 32 acts. The production of each dish has been worked out to the last detail. The success or the failure of the technique and procedures underlying these dishes can come down to a drop, a degree, or a second too much or too little. And while failure is not an option here, there's a remarkable lack of chaos for a large kitchen. Less banging and yelling, certainly not the mosh pit environments I'm used to. Cool, elegant, quiet, modern. 55 cooks serve one seating per night of 55 guests. It's more like the spirit of mission control or the bridge of the enterprise. You know, boldly going where no kitchen has gone before. Ferran comes out to greet me and our mutual friend and book editor, Anique Lapointe, and introduces me to Oriol Castro, the one member of the Taillere who was absent the day before. We're seated in the kitchen at the chef's table, right in the middle of the action. All right, feed me. One hardly expects to begin this meal with a cocktail and a basket of rolls, so a frappe of green pine water served with artichoke chips isn't so much surprising as it is surprisingly appropriate. Salud. That was water of a pine tree. This is great. So you would think really overpowering, you know, uh, aromatic. No, 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 it's clean and astringent. And it goes well with this artichoke chip. So did I understand him correctly? He said this is only the, like the third time he's eaten in the kitchen? No, no, no. No, no, he, he eats a lot in the kitchen, but alone, just around seven, he eats. He eats all the plates. Does he think he'll be able to relax and enjoy, or was he, is the radar on? No. <laughs> the radar is on. Yeah, the radar is on.
Out of the corner of my eye, I begin to see strange and wondrous shapes and textures emerging from the kitchen. A series of small tapas-like plates that I've never seen before. Lemon tempura with licorice? Raspberry lily pads? Rhubarb with black pepper. It's great. There's no shyness in the flavors here. Maybe coyness, but shyness, no. Ah, a fried chip of the skin of the sea cucumber. Yeah, we're gonna eat the inside of the sea cucumber later. And it is just, mm. This is, pork skin's always one of my favorite things, with yogurt. These aren't like the pork rinds you buy at your local 7-Eleven. They do like in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, These pork scratchings are made from Iberico ham fat, the best in the world. Salty, crunchy, flavored fat complemented by a creamy, sour yogurt. Wonderful. Oh, man. This is not a combination that would have occurred to me, but man, it's good. Even in these opening dishes that preface the main courses, what Ferran calls snacks, you can begin to sense the innovation, an impish sense of humor at work. Jamon de Toro arrives next. A pun on Toro for bull. It's in fact fatty tuna belly, cured and flavored like Iberico ham, served with silver pincers designed to pick up ethereally thin slices without bunching or tearing. This is a posh thing. This is at the limit of snobbery for him. It's outrageous. Adria is combining elements that I never imagined could go together. Come on. Huh. Cherry with ham. Cherry with, cherry with ham. It looked like a cherry and white fondant. It's a cherry dipped in Iberico ham fat. So you get this full Iberico ham fat flavor, already a good thing, and then this cl clean, sort of a, a cleansing uh, cherry it explodes in the center. Uh, they're outrageous. And when you're an innovator like Adria, it's not only about the thoughtful combination of elements that is new, but the process in which they're combined that's so unique. The next course is called Golden Egg. A single raw egg yolk shellacked in caramel. A tiny golden pillow. Like a number of Adria dishes, registers flavors on the tongue in distinct sequence. First shock, disorientation, and comforting reassurance. I taste raw egg yolk. Egg yolk. Caramel. Caramel. In 1996, it's a technique they discovered. They can caramelize everything they want. Yeah, it's, it's two, two or three distinct flavors and tastes. Geez, what's next? A cheese ice cream sandwich? Oh, uh, yeah. A tiny Parmigiano ice cream sandwich is an extreme example of playing on comfort food. I've never had anything like this before, but this has many memories for me. In some years, you'll see it in the supermarket. No, no, me, no. Not his, but somebody will just pick it up. Again and again, things are not what they seem. He suckers you in and then gives you something else. Apple caviar. Tiny, beautiful globules of unearthly apple essence are served in a caviar tin. Looks like caviar, but tastes like pure apple. A revelatory and thoroughly delicious practical joke. Trademark imitation bouillie. <laughs> All the cooks in the world are going crazy to know how this can be done. This is the only one we haven't explained to everybody. It's got the same feel as, as caviar. They explode in your mouth just like caviar, like beluga. Cotton candy carcass of tiny fish. A small fried fish cocooned by sweet sugar gauze. It's like an edible dust bunny that you found under your bed, only delicious. It's the scariest looking dish I've ever seen. This is science fiction. It was a, an amazing eating sensation. I know people who would get very upset seeing that dish. That was frightening and it brought up memories of, you know, corpses and, and Edgar Allan Poe and childhood uh, cotton candy at the same time. Not juxtapositions you'd, you'd, that would immediately come to mind. As soon as you bite in, it makes immediate sense. 
Adria watches me closely as I eat each course, things rarely as they appear. His face lights up again and again as my face registers surprise, confusion, astonishment. A ravioli filling, miraculously suspended in space, with no pasta or outer shell to contain it. This pea ravioli is a seemingly physically impossible concoction in which liquid essence of bright green fresh baby peas is wrapped only in itself. It's outrageous. It's ravioli without ravioli skin. It's as if you had, no, there's, there's no as if, about, there's nothing like it. It just kind of, it immediately dissolves into liquid essence of green pea. And yet the entire dish is essentially green pea. There's no, there's no, no pasta on the outside. There's no, no, nothing holding it together. It's just kind of. <laughs> Carrot air is an intensely flavored, truly lighter than air froth of carrot and tangerine served in a cut glass bowl. I accidentally inhale while bringing a spoonful to my mouth, aspirating some into my lungs. Delightful, but dangerous. You know, they say I inhaled that dish. I really did. <laughs> I had no idea how light it was going to be. And I inhaled as I was putting it in my mouth. I'm kind of having the childhood I never had here, actually. There's definitely a sense of wonder. Yeah, it is, there is, yeah, there is that. I don't think he'd mind hearing that. A lot of the dishes have an initial flavor, and then a, a secondary, and then a tertiary, and then, and then an aftertaste. Oh, pardon me. More surprises to come. I've heard about this. This is another kind of revolutionary process here. The improbable, even inconceivable sounding iced powder of foie gras with foie gras consomme is truly one of those important ideas Adria spoke of back at the tire. How the frozen, finely ground foie gras powder maintains its structural integrity in a bowl of hot foie consomme, I will never know. It defies physics. This powder melts, it's cold, it's frozen, and it melts immediately into a, into a hot. You know, I live and breathe foie. I made it all new. That was like eating it for the first time. This was one of those two or three great ideas he was talking about at the Taiyan, right? But really, if you want new emotions, and really big emotions, you need new techniques. These are smart and useful techniques, not just a pose or technique for technique's sake. Ferran elicits surprise and wonder with honest innovation and process. What he does is a direct challenge to the perceived wisdom of centuries of classical cooking. A high-risk, high-wire act like El Bulli restaurant demands questions of its diners as well. Is it food? or novelty? Is it dining in any sense of what a meal should be? And is it good in the traditional sense of that word when applied to what is presumably a meal? The constantly evolving 32 courses, often nearly five hour meal at El Bulli, seems to gleefully invite furious debate. Two pristine oysters in their own essence. Oysters with oysters and yogurt. Hazelnut yogurt cream rolled with macadamia nut and then a dot of lemon relish. When eaten in sequence, it takes the tongue on a wild yet strangely familiar trip around the world and then right back to your first oyster. I feel like I've eaten that dish my whole life and I loved it. Pace and rhythm, Adria says, are important. One mustn't eat too slowly or one gets sluggish and tired. A shimmering, translucent globe of raw tuna bone marrow with caviar. It's like top quality Edo style sushi from another planet. Oh wow. Like all the courses I try, it has a progression of clean, intense and precise flavors and a pleasurable aftertaste that never intrude on the course to follow. 
Cuttlefish and coconut ravioli are two tight pillows of cuttlefish which explode in the mouth, rudely and unexpectedly flooding it with coconut liquid. There's no fusion here. You know, there's no blending of flavors into a muddy sort of a general crowd of flavors all combining to make one flavor. There are individual clean flavors that you kind of put together, either all at the same time or in rapid succession. Scampi with rosemary is scampi in its own sauce, made largely from the good stuff found in the head. The rosemary is a sprig of fresh rosemary served on the side to be sniffed and discarded so as not to blow out the palate by actually eating the strong, highly aromatic herb. Why does this make sense? Why is this working for me? It's at 70%. Of the plate is a scent. And if you ate the rosemary, everything would taste rosemary. Right, no, no. So Just the you, smell. you smell right. and you eat the scampi. We never use the scent to eat, but you use it to drink wine. Socially, it's not well received. And he sees it as an obligation get, get people smelling food again. Nothing seems to go to waste in this kitchen. Earlier in the meal, we ate the deep fried skin of a sea cucumber. And next up is its meaty interior garnished with rhubarb and mentaiko, a spicy codro condiment. Do you remember the skin you ate before? Yes. Oh, that's great. So this is inspired by Rafa's, a place that I have yet to eat, by the way, but his favorite restaurant, I'm guessing his favorite restaurant on earth. He's honoring a 20-seat restaurant in town, right? Yeah, we'll find out tomorrow. The only thing that angers him is when people say that are a strange thing in a buoy. There are new things, but they're not strange. We have the memory of these tastes. Two meters of Parmesan cheese spaghetti is one long strand of cheese-flavored consomme, suspended with agar-agar, coiled in the bowl like a small portion of spaghetti carbonara. The future is here. Very cool. To be slurped up and into the mouth in one long, loud, sucking movement. Okay. Because <laughs> Mr. Audrey is only too happy to demonstrate. Come on. I'm a loser. What can I say? He did it all in one strand. I, I, I had this structural integrity problems. Even traditional dishes in Adria's kitchen have been reapproached and made new. It's a cannelloni of bone marrow and truffle. And rabbit brains. With rabbit brains. And oh, yeah. It's over the top. Oh. I sit and eat what is for me by turns a delicious, shattering, wondrous, confusing, strangely comforting, frightening, and always wonderful meal. And then, the desserts. Marble soup. Delicate marbles of coffee and rose water floating in lychee soup. Something called chocolate soil is next. Looking like a pile of dirt and pebbles, but is actually pure chocolatey goodness. A Wonder Bread appearing loaf called the Morphing virtually disappears on the tongue, leaving no residue or trace of having once been there. Where'd it go? And finally, snowballs. Shavings of lemon ice with the consistency of new snow, with a surprise filling of strawberries, lemon, and roses. A delightful remembrance of a snowy day. Snowball! Oh. I love the little chips. It looks like snow. <laughs> And it, it has the same consistency of these snowballs of my youth. If, if the school bully ever threw a snowball, like, and it hit you right in the mouth, the consistency was just like this. Only this is much more delicious. Was it good? 
I don't know if that's a word one should use when describing the El Bulli experience. It's challenging, fun, constantly entertaining, a fantastic shock to the system, an amusement park ride, a bold, bold statement, a work of art in every sense of that word. He goes at food, he goes at the dining experience like a film director. It's about timing and pace and thrills and surprise and showmanship and science, all of these things. But at its core, this is food that tastes good. Is it good? Yes, yes, it's really good. Does it make sense? Yes, yes, it, it makes sense. Adria likes the word magic, and that's exactly what it felt like. If the experience at El Bulli workshop and restaurant weren't enough to give me insight into Ferran Adria's mind, philosophy, and food, the next day he asked me to meet him in the center of the small town of Rosas, Spain, to have lunch at one of his favorite restaurants in the world. Okay, so we're going to probably Ferran's favorite restaurant on earth. It's called Rafa's. It's all about fish, cooked very simply by a dedicated maniac who tells me he doesn't want any more business. He, he, there's not enough great fish in the world to handle the business he has, so I'm not gonna tell you exactly where this place is. Eat your heart out. And it is here, I think, that the true nature of Adria revealed itself. Rafa's is a simple, informal, 20-seat restaurant that serves impeccably fresh, but decidedly straightforward seafood. Almost always cooked with only sea salt and a little olive oil. A one-man operation consisting of Rafa, the proprietor, his wife, a grill, a few burners, and a glass counter displaying the catch of only a few hours ago. People are maniacal, fiercely dedicated to this restaurant. And uh, Rafa is a guy who, if he doesn't have ultra fresh fish, he's not open, period. But, highest, most impeccable standards. Most of this stuff was flopping around in the water just a few hours ago. And if it wasn't, he's not opening the doors. A purist, uh, a perfectionist, um, and it's all about fish uh, presented in its simplest and in the most un unadulterated form. One would think that there's an incongruity between the food we ate last night and the food that we're eating today. But I don't think so. I think it's all of a part. These are beautiful, unbelievably fresh. Tiny little conk, and you twist them out, dip in a little vinaigrette. And, mm. Look at that thing. Tagliarina. Just steamed with a little white wine. I think there might have been some garlic near it at one point, but it's sweet, unadulterated. A plate that incorporates just langoustin and water and nothing else and gets gets to the heart of the matter, which is La memoire de la goût. The, the, mem the memory of taste. In the end, this is what it's all about. What goes on in there? You know, this is sauce that God made. Oh, yeah. He loves fish, he tells me. And he uses the fish at Rafa's as a reference for his sense memory. His work, as he sees it, is to try to understand and to see if he can do something new with this and yet still remind a person of their first taste of fresh fish. In his own new and miraculous way, that's exactly what he's doing. The great French chef uh, Carême, who sought to blend uh, gastronomy and architecture, was said to believe that gastronomy is a blending of art, food, and science. Was he right? I don't know, but he has a distant cousin, perhaps, in Adrius. Before I met him, I didn't know what to think of Ferran Adria. To tell you the truth, what little I knew about him, the conceptual nature of his work, the revolutionary nature of his work, it was deeply threatening to me, and I think to a lot of other old school chefs and cooks. This is not your ordinary food. 
You ask yourself at the end of this experience, what is a meal? What should a meal be? What can a meal be? Should food be science? Should food be art? I don't know. But I think these are questions that, that Farron Adri asks every day and explores every day. What he does is a challenge to the very foundations of what we do. The realm of the possible becomes suddenly much larger in strange, fabulous, and slightly scary new ways. Things are different now.